So I'm Steve, I work at BlackBot in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, I've been there for 13 years, uh, that entire career, part of the uh, documentation slash user education slash newly minted content design development team. Um, and then as Nick pointed out, um, for that entire span plus some, I have been a political cartoonist for the Alt Weekly in Charleston, Charleston City Paper. Um, so a, I have a deadline addiction and I'm glad to find a support group here at Write the, at Write the Docs. Um, and I also have learned the value of a good visual um, in the communication and the content experience. Um, probably one of uh, my biggest influences, inspirations as a cartoonist was uh, Berkeley Brethed, uh, best known for his comic strip Bloom County. And he summed it up pretty well like this. If you stick an illustration of a farting dog below nearly any random words, they'll be read with more import than without the random dog, the fart farting dog. <laughs> um, if you think about that, if you think about your day-to-day -day content consumption, think about your Twitter feed, um, as you're scrolling through, you're more likely to stop and pause on the tweet uh, with the GIF or the image, some sort of visual. Um, and marketers know that, so you know that's why you see more and more social media posts with images in them uh, selling new stuff. Um, of course, there's science behind it. Um, if you can Google brain science and visuals, you'll find umpteen thousand different stats to kind of prove that point. Uh, the brain processes visuals faster uh, than words. As an editorial cartoonist, I weaponize that on a weekly basis. Uh, a really good cartoon is one that's highly visual, low on words, and the whole point of my job in that role is to uh, inform the reader of an issue, give an opinion, and provide some sort of biting commentary. Now, if you're with me on that opinion, that cartoon is a sudden, like, in your eyeball, into your brain, and it makes you laugh. If you're on the opposite side of the opinion with me, you may hate me, it feels like I punched you in the nose. It's a very visceral reaction because of that speed of the content. As documentarians, we can harness that for good. Um, I'm sure we're all aware that time and our audience's kind of attention span is our number one enemy. So if we can kind of communicate quickly and succinctly without them realizing that they're actually being fed content, all the better. Um, images also help with retention of information. Um, so again, a lot of our content is to help train users uh, get them onboarded, get them familiar with a feature, and have them never ask that question again. So if we can kind of keep that information from slipping um, out of their short-term memory banks like right away, if we can help them keep it, all the better. A good image is kind of like an earworm, uh, the song that gets stuck in your head. Uh, but again, we can harness that for good as documentarians. Um, and this last I, I thought was particularly relevant to this crowd, right? A lot of the content we write is how to do something. Uh, instructions, and you can look at this stat and you're like, that's amazing, 323% better. And yeah, illustrations do provide a lot of clarity to instructions. Um, you can look at like Ikea, right? So you get this fancy box of the Swedish furniture with a funky name, and you're like, yes, unbox it, and there's thousands of pieces and parts and Allen wrench, and you're like, okay, what do I do? They've taken this to like the next level, because it's all illustrations. We don't need words at Ikea, that's fantastic. Um, before I did my job at BlackBot, I worked for a company that did hospital equipment. And I, I could look back now and wonder how many countless lives were saved by the fact that I could do documentation and throw in an illustration showing exactly where on that bed that assembly had to go. Um, so that's great for industry. For technology, it's a little different, right? We, uh, we still use how-to information, um, but we don't have thousands of pieces and parts of a bookcase or a bed. We have user interface to walk you through the user experience. Um, so it's a little wonder that screenshots became kind of the go-to visual, right? And screenshots do serve a purpose. Um, and this, this is like one of our older products. All of our older products at Blackboard come with like this entire library full of PDFs. Um, often single source from the help content, but all kind of thrown in with screenshots walking you through the process. And the screenshots in this case do kind of provide some sort of navigation, uh, provide some context, some confirmation that you're at the right spot. Like if you don't see this screen, you done messed up somewhere along the way. Um, this is the, that's the kind of the intent of the screenshots here. We have still do PDFs, but we have drastically cut back. And that could be a talk for another day. Uh, we've tried to totally kill PDFs, but our customers still kind of love them for some reason. So we try to focus on the very specific use cases for a PDF. 
Um, in this case, it's like a page from a getting started guide. So this is something that we provide to customers as part of like the sales process, when it's part of being onboarded, uh, something they might refer to to kind of get up to speed on the product before they even log in for the first time. In this case, the screenshots provide more of an introduction to the features, so I try to introduce some familiarity so that when they see it in the product, there's some recognition. Um, and of course, we also do blogs, we're a very active community for a lot of our products, and we often repurpose help content into the blog, um, and the blogs are often deep dives into features. Um, in this case, it's like a what's new post. And again, the same sort of use case for a screenshot fits here, where this is a feature you've not seen before, it's brand new, go ahead, you're seeing it in the context of the community, here's what it looks like. So when you see it, you, it looks not as daunting or as strange to you or as unfamiliar. Um, of course, it's also the, <laughs> the wall of text, right? Uh, as a political cartoonist, I would make a crack about another wall, I'm gonna contain myself, but we, this, is our, this is our kind of bane of existence as documentarians, right? We have the wall of text. As a re user experience perspective, it's daunting, it's overwhelming, it's very off-putting. Um, I'm sure we have tons of users who would just see this and immediately shut the document and go somewhere else, right? Um, so it's tempting to kind of look at a wall of text and go, you know what this needs? This needs a screenshot. This would be amazing with a visual. We know there's some power in the visuals. Screenshot's easy, we throw it in there. A lot of ways, if you're using a screenshot just to break a wall of text, you're throwing graffiti on a wall. The wall's not going away, the wall's still there. Um, it's also kind of like when you have content, when you get asked to write content to kind of improve a clumsy user experience. That's not really the right answer to that question. You know, go back and try to fix the user experience. Um, so, but I do hear the use case of, I just want to throw a screenshot in there because it's a wall of text, otherwise I need to break it up. Um, and that's great, but it also reminds me of like Spider-Man, where there was a lot of power in visuals, uh, but we need to use that responsibly. And maybe a screenshot isn't the best answer for everything. In fact, maybe a screenshot is not the right answer at all, because a screenshot can come, can, is easy, but it brings with it a lot of considerations and overhead we may want to consider. For example, if you localize your content, um, that's definitely a consideration, right? If you do translation, you know that every word counts, and that includes words and images, and what is a screenshot but just this image with a lot of words from the UI in it? Um, so you, you may have to decide at you know, translation time, what do we do with a translation content? Do we localize the screenshots? Do we go back in and take new screenshots from a translated you know, interface? Or do we say, you know what, screenshots aren't really all that important, we're gonna take them out of the localized content. At which point you may ask yourself, okay, if the screenshots aren't contributing that much to the content experience for a localized output, are they really contributing that much for your native tongue as well? Um, accessibility is another consideration. I mean, obviously your visual communication is gonna be a totally different experience for someone you know, using that through a screen reader. Um, and then for every image you include, you should include an alt tag, and the alt tag shouldn't just be something generic, like a screenshot, right? It should actually describe the, the message the screenshot is providing, right? The screenshot is showing, you know, where to click on the, on the interface, because we, and maybe that's because, you know, if you see the interface, it's a, an item you know has the discoverability issues, for example. Um, but you need to describe the intent of the message of the screenshot within the alt tag. Um, and that, again, that may be a point where you kind of go, I have nothing to say about the screenshot, we just threw it in here because we we're trying to break up a wall of text. Or because we always throw in screenshots. Um, and something, a bigger kind of more recent development, at least for Blackbaud, new consideration, is that you know, over the years we have moved from waterfall to agile development, uh, and with that our release cadence has changed dramatically. Historically, when I first came to Blackbaud, uh, we did yearly, maybe quarterly releases, you know, and then maybe every couple months. Now it's continuous deployment. That train is always moving, we're always creating new features, it's very iterative development, and that creates a lot of churn in terms of the user interface. It also creates a lot of churn in terms of the content. Uh, and screenshots are something that you have to factor into that. Is it worth, the screenshot bringing that much to the conversation? that's worth the extra overhead? Or is this a point where you kind of step back and say, maybe there's something else. Maybe we don't need the screenshot, or maybe there's another visual altogether. 
Um, so like I said, we still use PDFs and, uh, for some of the output. Screenshots definitely play a role in that. We have um, blog, again, screenshots. And a lot of that is because the context for this content is outside of the application. It's something that user, user experiences when they're not actively working in, in the program. Um, in the program, we still do screenshots. Like I said, we, uh, this is our help content. We've worked really hard to make it part of the user experience, part of the UI. We don't have them go out to like a tri-pane view or some external resource when they call for help within the application. We bring the content to them. Um, and this is our what's new topic for our next generation fundraising product. And like I said, continuous deployment has been a big shift for us as a company. It's been an even bigger shift for our customers who are very used to getting features every quarter and a big thick PDF new feature guide. And now they're getting features any day of the week. Uh, we pop this what's new like automatically when they first log in about once a week, um, about the same time every week. So we've kind of trained them like Pavlov dog. If we do skip a week, we can track the stats and find that they're actually looking for this content. So they're, they're thirsty for it. Uh, but like I said, we repurpose the what's new content from the blog, from the help into the blog. This is that kind of counterpart. And again, they experience this content when they first log in. So to introduce the feature, we've included a screenshot. However, in more just-in-time content, like if I'm working on a form um, and I have a pull the procedure, we're not including the screenshot. Part of that is because it's baked in. But at the same time, if you look at the U content here in the UI, the UI is a bunch of fields. The procedure is the same order of fields. Continuous deployment does factor into that as well. If we decide we're going to miss a screenshot or update screenshots later, we've already established that people register that visual much faster than the content. So if they open your help having a question about a brand new field, and they see a screenshot without that field, immediately they're kind of questioning the, the current, how current the content is. Um, that may undermine the trust they have in your, in your content, and they may, as, as a resource as a whole, not just a single topic. Um, and let's face it, form after form after form are a lot of fields this is the bulk of what we document within our product. Um, the screenshot doesn't contribute that much to that conversation, right? You're showing them a list of fields and a content that's often a procedure with a list of fields. Um, now, there are times where we've tried different visuals. Now, when we introduced this gift record, which is like a key piece of the fundraising solution, we could have thrown in a screenshot of a gift record um, but it didn't really speak to the concept of a gift record. Now, this is what I use as a fundraiser to kind of get all the gory details about donation that came in, who gave it, how they pay for it, what do they want us to use it on. Um, so we created this, this visual. I know Kat mentioned earlier about kind of using Twitter as a canary in the coal mine. When we get feedback like this in Twitter, we're ecstatic. This is like fantastic. People don't normally talk about the content um, in Twitter, but to see that a graphic can not only kind of convey the concept better than a screenshot may have, but also provide that spark of whimsy uh, to user experience. That's something, like I said, the screenshot, you know, we don't get that kind of mileage of a screenshot. We've also taken that same approach within standard help content as well. So here is more just-in-time content for this, this form. Uh, on this form, we manage basically how we refer to a donor in a communication. Um, if you look at your mailbox, you probably have appeals from your alumni association, your foundation, from your college, or somewhere you gave to last year. Um, they're probably still sending you letters or postcards, because snail mail is very big still within the fundraising industry. Um, and how, how you track, how you refer to that donor and those communications is important. So part of that is this concept of an addressee and a salutation. We've had them around forever. They're often very confusing for, for our users. They get it mixed up, they're not sure of the context. And we have help content that explains it. But at one point, we're like, you know what, if we could just show them in context of the communication, what is what, that would answer it. And we did this, we updated this help topic with this visual. The engineer had been working on this form sprint after sprint after sprint. It was like he had a eureka moment. He was like, this is what I've been doing? This is it? So as you work on dev docs even, if you're working on endpoints or you know, working on information that has a certain context, maybe don't show them you know, how it could look on a form, but instead, what's the real world counterpart? What's the concept? Illustrate that. Uh, we've included infographics. Uh, donor lifecycle is kind of a sense of 
where I am as a donor in my relationship with the organization. Did I give once, never again? Did I give once 11 months ago? So um, if I don't give again, I'm going to be at risk, or I'm at risk now, maybe I'll be lapsing and lost. Or if I give again, what's my status there? We have, you know, it's eight different statuses. We have a blurb for each one. But this infographic really kind of gave them a snapshot what that relationship was. And this is something that we actually see pulled out, like people, you know, pull this from the help content posted in the community. There's a Facebook group, I've seen it out in there. Marketers tend to love it. So it's kind of something that in a snapshot, in a matter of, you know, seconds hopefully, you can convey the whole relationship of these statuses, what they mean um, in context of the giving, in a much quicker rate than a screenshot of that, that report would do or you know, running through eight blurbs of content. Now there are some times when a screenshot is just inevitable, right? So I've, you know, modals and forms are one thing. We can kind of go, okay, I can see he's got a point maybe that I don't need to show a screenshot for every procedure because it's kind of redundant. Uh, but there are other times where the UI is not that simple, right? So this is a tool, it's a reporting tool that we provide. Um, we actually have an early adopter program at the moment. And it's like a drag and drop tool. So I can, as a user, I can go in here and say, here's what I want to measure, and pull it over. Here's how I want to break that measurement up by. Um, and then our testing, what we found is that when people land on this UI, it's like a blank slate moment. It's overwhelming. It's kind of almost like that wall of text, right? They don't know where to begin. It's kind of overwhelming, daunting. Um, so we started trying to figure out how we can tackle this from a user assistance perspective. Should we do screenshots? Maybe this is time to throw some screenshots in there. Maybe even do a video. Um, and what we found is that when we did screenshots or working with live data, essentially, the user focused on the wrong stuff, right? They're attaching, they're coming to this tool with a certain report in their head. And the screenshots and examples we gave were not that report, right? Um, so that they suddenly felt a disconnect. They couldn't quite get past the fact that the examples were not what they have in their head. And we're just trying to focus on the UI-isms, where to begin, where to move things around, um, and to complicate matters. Um, this is a tool that we use across a whole variety of products. So I've mentioned fundraising a good bit, uh, but we also serve, we have products for financials, uh, education solutions for schools. And so if they see like an example like we were showing for the fundraisers, they have zero context, even, even worse context than a fundraiser would have. So we started thinking about what, what, what can we do to kind of help the user focus on the right stuff. Apparently a screenshot wasn't going to do that trick. Well, again, going back to comics, right? So this is Scott McCloud, Understanding Comics. It's required reading for a cartoonist. It's highly recommended reading for anybody who wants to do any type of visual communication. And he points out that if you see an illustration or a photograph um, of someone, and it's a highly rendered illustration, for example, you see that person. But if you start stripping away the details uh, down to like a smiley face or an emoji essentially, you relate more to it. You can see yourself in it. So we applied that same logic to that same UI, right? Abstracted away all of the data. Basically took a screenshot, but then took it into Adobe Illustrator, traced it essentially, and made everything down to the basic shapes, like a smiley face, like an emoji, um, but to the basics. And that way, we could provide instructions that kind of focus the user on what we want them to focus on, the UI, right? Here are the patterns. Here's where you start, step by step, uh, and walk them through the process. And this actually worked. We actually tested it with users, and they're like, well, now I know where to begin. Now I get it. Um, whereas before, they were too hung up on the wrong details. And kind of a byproduct of this is that we suddenly had these artifacts that we could leverage for other, for other content. Um, so I mentioned PDFs, right? We, we're still trying to get them away, wean them off of PDFs, wean them away from printing out of our product, right? The product is now something they use on their phone. They still want to print it out. We're like, why? Just pull it out on your phone and use it. PDFs are the same way. They have this thirst for how something paper, tangible, something that they can just pass out. Um, but we were trying to wean them off that because PDFs are just not scalable. They get out of date much more, you know, much more readily than they used to. Um, so we created this online quick start guide, uh, which we may have done as a PDF before, did it online, used the same artifacts, broke that process down even more, 
This tested really well. It was a tool that we could easily just kind of share out as part of like that onboarding process. Um, as of last week, they were trying to find a way to kind of wire this in from the application itself because it was tracking so well. Um, and we also found a way, since they were all in Illustrator, to take it a step further. Say, you know what, here's where you don't need print. Here's why you don't need a screenshot. We can show you the process, animate it in a GIF, uh, and simplify that process down. Um, so again, kind of in closing, there's a lot of power in a visual. Uh, as a cartoonist, I, I'm with you on that, and there's brain science to back that up. Screenshot may not always be that visual to use. Screenshot is right in a lot of contexts, um, but it may not really support the message like you hope it would. There are other alternatives to explore, and I hope you have fun trying to find ways to engage your user with visuals, um, but think outside the screenshot. Thank you very much.